The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Kelly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is an icon carrying on from Ash Wednesday of the, of the patriarch Abraham. And today is the first Sunday in Lent and as we've heard, the Lent focus here at St. Mark's is prayer. We have the Wednesday evening prayer course, and this is the first of a series of six uh, sermons on important, significant prayers in the Old Testament, drawing out insights into how God loves us. Some of them are deeply mysterious, often problematic, but there is nowhere better to grapple with the deep things of prayer and, uh, and the God to whom we pray. This passage is no exception. We jump straight in at the deep end. For me, the message of this passage is that Abraham was a friend of God. He prayed to God at the instigation of God, but he did not get the answer he wanted. Big questions arise. Does God care? What about the injustices we see in the world? How are we meant to approach huge issues with our infinite God as such small creatures? What can we learn from this? Next, please. So Abraham intercedes with God, and for me, this is a very troubling uh, problem passage. So when you're a doctor, there are actually advantages of being old like me. When you're old and admit you don't know something, people think you're very wise and humble. Whereas if you're young and say you don't know, people think you're an idiot. So I'm going to play to hopefully uh, play, play the humble card over this message because if there's anybody in this church who really gets this passage, come right up here and take over and I'll go and have an early cup of coffee. Uh, there are impossibly difficult pa things in this passage we've just read. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit calls difficult passages like this to be written and to survive to this day because we can learn from them, even if we don't understand at all. But we honestly have to confront these difficulties. The response to the difficulties cannot be to ignore it and the hope it will go away. It won't. 
But I think we can learn a lot from this passage about prayer, about the work of Jesus, and a really important message for those of us struggling today. First, some background. There's no doubt that Sodom and Gomorrah were cities of intense evil. The exact nature of what the evil was, their sins, is unknown to us, but was clearly known to God. Whether it was the outcry of oppressed people, the victims of injustice, or the voices of the sins themselves, or both, which reached God's ears, we cannot know. We do know that God proposed to destroy the cities of the plains. The cities contained little children and animals, but God seems blind to this. Not only, God not only contemplated mass destruction, but actually carried it out. This raises big and difficult questions, but today the focus is on prayer. And if you have difficult questions, Dave will be very happy to answer them after the service. However, this does show how seriously God takes sin. Sin is not just perpetrated by one human against another. It is something that involves God directly. Remember when Cain murdered his brother Abel, God says to Cain, listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. God hears and sees. We can't play a game of let's pretend or it doesn't matter. So God had to find a solution for all our sins. I believe we see from this passage that God did not want to destroy the cities of the plain any more than he wants to destroy us. He wanted to avoid destruction if he could. I do not believe that God delights in destruction of his creation under any circumstances. But sin matters. It's no good pretending it didn't happen. Our sins have to be faced up to, owned and repented. <clears throat> like a wine stain on a white tablecloth, you can't get it to go away just putting, by just putting a vase of flowers on top of it. Next, please. So how did Abraham approach God, his posture of prayer? What do we learn from our, for our prayer lives from Abraham's intercession for the cities? Importantly, <clears throat> note that this intercession started from God. If God had not decided to tell Abraham of his plans, Abraham could not have started praying for the cities. Now there are clearly people we should pray for regularly without being asked. Our families, the sick, the bereaved, for example. But are we also tuning in to find if there are things that God wants us to pray for? Unlike Abraham, we know that we do not pray alone. In his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 34, Paul tells us that Jesus is constantly praying for us at the right hand of God. And in verses 26 and 27, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words because we do not know how to pray as we ought. So do we try to pray in tune to those divine prayers and be directed in prayer to join our efforts with the heavenly prayers? Abraham approached God in holy fear, aware of his littleness, but amazingly in trust and friendship. Abraham has a clear view of himself and God. Although God talked with Abraham as a friend, Abraham clearly saw himself as dust and ashes. Another lesson for us. Next slide, please. So the question, the request, are you really going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? God, Abraham asked God, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the trouble is justice demands a strict accounting for sins. Debts must be paid. And if you cannot pay, what then does justice demand? Abraham is persistent in prayer and seems to barter with God haggling with God like we might haggle in the marketplace, beating God down from 50 just people to the 10 who would have been enough to save the city. In a minute, we fast forward many centuries to the return to the theme of the just for whom sake destruction is averted. We learn that Abraham was bold and persistent. He tried not to take no for an answer. Next slide, please. So, trust and faith, interceding with God, will not the judge of all the world do right? Abraham's prayer was not answered. The cities were not saved. 
But importantly, God responded. He didn't ignore Abraham. He responded to Abraham. And God never ignores prayers. His response may not be what we asked for. Perhaps most famously, St. Paul recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 8 and 9 that he had three times begged for a thorn in his side to be taken away. Commentators are divided as to what that thorn was. Was it epilepsy? Was it some physically painful illness? The answer from God was not to take it away, but to say, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Paul did not get what he wanted, but he was not ignored. God listened and responded in a different way. It's the same with children and parents. Parents always listen to their children, but the wise parent will not always say yes. A child may think it's a good idea to eat a chocolate ice cream the size of their head every day, but most parents, wise parents will think there's a different, the different diet will be rather better. So be certain, prayers are never ignored. Hebrews 13.5, he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So God was ready to spare Sodom despite the terrible sins being committed if ten just men could be discovered. They were not, and destruction followed. Abraham had to trust his petition to God and trust God's response. We need to do the same. Next slide, please. So moving forward across the centuries, what light does this shed on Jesus? How does this incident shine light on Jesus? Because this episode is a microcosm of God's much bigger problem. How does he deal with the sins of the whole world? The blood of so many innocents, innocents screams from the earth. The exploitation and oppression. But the rapacious greed and selfishness. Trafficking, the cavalier dismissal of God and so much more. To ignore this is to cheapen and disrespect the suffering that has been endured. Next slide, please. This is G.K. Chesterton, who wrote the Father Brown stories that some, of you, some may have read or seen on TV. Famously, G.K. Chesterton responded to a question from the Times about what is wrong with the world by writing, Dear Sir, I am, signed G.K. Chesterton. How is God to deal with our sins? If a latter-day Abraham started to negotiate God down for a few just people so that sins could be set aside, how could he beat God down? And would it do any good? Would these hypothetical just people ever be found? So God's solution was to provide just one just person, and Jesus Christ, his only son, perfectly human, fully God. Jesus, coming as a first century Jewish peasant in occupied Palestine, living the life we were all meant to leave if the fall had not happened walking perfectly in the will of God. Now there is one just man who carries away the sins of the world, a just man provided by God. And this was a costly gift. Remember Jesus praying in Gethsemane, his sweat falling off him like great drops of blood, praying in agony if it was possible, let this cup be taken away. But importantly, not my will but yours be done. How much seeing his son in agony of spirit must have agonized God the Father. Earthly parents would willingly step into the shoes of their children to spare them any ordeal. But God the Father could not. He had to watch until, seeing, until the moment, seeing Jesus laden with our sins, he turned away, unable to look on that sight. But God had found the solution. Remember the chorus? On the Mount of Crucifixion, Fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God, God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Justice was done and the eternal destruction of all was averted by love without subverting that justice. Sin was not cheapened not trivialized, the sufferings of the oppressed not disrespected. Next slide. This is John Macefield, the poet laureate, 
who wrote this poem, The Everlasting Mercy. And if you haven't read it, it's well worth it. It's about Saul Cain, a drunken brawler who came to Christ at the end of the poem. At one stage, in the pub, drunk and raving, he is confronted by Miss Bourne, a Quaker woman, who responds in this way to his taunting. Saul Cain, she said, when next you drink, do me the gentleness to think that every drop of drink accursed makes Christ within you die of thirst, that every dirty word you say is one more flint upon his way, another thorn about his head, another mock by where he tread, another nail, another's cross. All that you are is that Christ's loss. No, let's pretend or trivializing sin there. Next slide, please. So what lessons can we learn from this? What have we learnt from Abraham about prayer? Though we are individuals, as individuals, we're like a puff of smoke on a tiny little speck whirling through the immensities of space-time. Yet in prayer, we are approaching a friend. This is a web telescope, staggering picture of a of galaxy on galaxy in this tremendous spiral. Think how insignificant we are compared with that. And yet, we approach God as a, fr as a friend. We can approach God with, with boldness and persistence. We know that God will never ignore what we ask. He will hear us and give the reply which is best for us, not necessarily what we ask for. God wants us to pray. But I also do not want to trivialize the effects of unanswered prayer. It hurts. I am praying for one of my little grandchildren who has very significant mental health issues and nothing seems to be changing. That is seemingly so, so hurtful of God. I am sure others have similar stories to tell. It is so easy to be discouraged, to think, why bother? But that's not what Abraham teaches us. We learn about a God who listens and responds, albeit in ways we may not expect. A God who is totally just, who cannot pretend that sin didn't happen, but he finds a way to subvert the just consequences of sin. A God who, knowing we cannot find the solution, provides the solution himself, so that demands of justice and the heart's desire of love and peace can be satisfied. And above all, surely he has carried our griefs and borne our sorrows. Finally, I return to Abraham's question to God. Shall not the judge of all the world do right? My 33 years as a consultant paediatrician have been times of rich blessing and fulfillment, but years also where I have witnessed almost an unimaginable tragedy and suffering in young children. I have seen prayers unanswered, the door seemingly locked and bolted from the other side, and deafening silence when I've tried to make sense of it. That is when I hold Abraham's question in my heart, and we can answer it, as Abraham could not, with a resounding yes from our own knowledge. Yes, the judge of all the earth shall do right, and much more than right. Justice leaves me lost and abandoned, but the judge of all the world has poured out love in sending Jesus, solving the problem of love and justice in the only way possible. So by the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit, and not by my own strength, I can walk by faith and not by sight no matter what, remembering that when it comes to crunch time, the judge of all the world did do right by ensuring the salvation of all the earth. If there are those struggling now, feeling abandoned by God, remember God's promise at the end of Matthew. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. This does not, de depends not on us, whether we feel good or worthy or happy or anything. It depends on God. Because of one thing I'm absolutely certain. However you feel, you are not ignored by God. He is there. He knows. He wants to hear your voice in prayer and helps us to pray. Next slide. Is there one, one more slide? Maybe I forgot to put it in. No, there it, <coughs> there it is. So this is uh, the picture of Jesus the Good Shepherd. And I want to end with some familiar words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table bef before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.